Hello everybody, and so this is going to be our preamble rule set video for Yeehaw that will be taking place this year in 2022. So this video is meant to be encouragement so that you guys can train over the course of the summer and the fall so that when you come down and partake, you will know all the rules, you'll be having plenty of time to train for it, etc. So this first preamble is going to cover um, all the armor requirements, all the gear requirements, the weapon requirements, as well as what to do and what to not to do. I will also be doing a couple follow-up videos, so keep your eyes out for those as I post them. So, for Yeehaw, the idea behind it is that everyone gets to play. Even if you don't own any armor, you will be able to play as long as you have tournament legal fencing gear. So as a perfect example of that, this is my guy Ryan. He has full gear that would allow him into any of our tournaments, such as Surfo, etc. Uh, underneath his officer jacket, he has solid elbows, spez heavies, a helmet with complete back of the head protector, shin guards, athletic cup, the standard, and of course a gorget underneath. These are the requirements. Any tournament that we do, any steel tournament, will have these exact same requirements. So if you're wondering if you're missing a piece, just look at that should be relatively self-explanatory but as this is dealing with armor and we want armor to have a point there are some special rules to consider so firstly Ryan here is representing our lowest level of combatant he does not have a padded jacket of any form this is all just protective gear so what he's wearing is equivocal in the game rules to what I am wearing just clothing this includes Spez officer jackets Jess Finley jackets as well as as spez caftans, etc. Anything that's not a gambeson, pretty much. Now, the other specialty rule with this is that Ryan has a lovely spez overlay that is nice and brightly colored. You can either use a chaperone, so a hood, over your fencing mask, or otherwise we'll be putting a large piece of colored tape on top of your mask. The reason behind this is that we don't want to have any incidents where someone who has limited vision in a helmet can't tell if you are wearing a helmet or not. We've had this happen before with silver fencing masks or people who don't own helmets but are wearing more armor. So there will be some form of bright color on top of your head so that you don't get brained. But in regards to the rule set, Ryan, a hit, a good hit anywhere with a one or two handed sword, cutter thrust, spear, whatever, will kill him. However, there is a golden rule. When it comes to striking with pole axes or axes of any kind, you are not striking people like this. You are thrusting. This is to ensure safety. There will be no exceptions for this. If you are caught striking with a pole axe against someone, that pole axe is being taken away. Otherwise, though this is our base level combat so now we're going to move up a little bit this is jake and he is now our slightly more tiered combatant really the gear is exactly the same as what ryan was wearing except jake here has a gambeson now in regards to our gambeson rules historic gambesons are okay as long as you have the sufficient padding underneath but we'll get back to that again in a moment or over but spez gambesons etc the ap light will still count so don't worry if it's not one of the big thick ones etc it's just got to have enough padding that we can tell this is a gambeson now what this gives you is this gives you immunity to one-handed cuts on any padded surface like this. So those of you that may own, for example, chosses, uh, padded chosses, or etc., that would give you immunity there. Um, in this case, it's only where the gambeson is. So for example, if a cut lands on Jake's forearm because he's wearing protective gear over, the gambeson is still okay. This is all going to be self-called, so we'll make sure everyone's very clear on this so you get some practice fighting for it. But if that cut lands here by the wrist, that's his hand. That would probably take it off. Otherwise, everything is pretty much exactly the same. Now, the next thing we're going to move into will be putting some layers of just simple munitions grade armor over this, which we expect to see pretty commonly. Okay, so now what we've done is we've put some pieces onto Jake. This is kind of what we're expecting most people to do, and I will be doing a separate video soon that is going over good cheap armor that you can buy that will be allowed that you can throw over your current fencing gear. So that'll be coming soon. But what we've done is Jake is thrown on a male mantle as well as a breastplate. So now this is where we get into the layer game, right? If you cut Jake anywhere below the waist, so you know, legs, etc., onto the hands, he still dies. Get cut in the head, he's as bareheaded as I am right now. But the mail and the plate now count for something on their own. So gambeson, padding, immunity to one-handed cuts, right? A two-handed thrust, uh, sorry, a two-handed cut or any thrust will still get through. Mail, even if it's just over a thing like a Jess Finley jacket or whatever, it counts for itself. Immunity to all 
cuts, a two-handed thrust will get through, so a structured thrust. And we'll be going over how to do that in a moment. So in this case, that covers his shoulders are pretty much immune to cuts. And then plate, immune to everything except the blow of a pole axe or hammer. Now, in Jake's case, because he is a lightly armored guy, you shouldn't be striking at the plate. Just stab him in the head or stab him in the arm or what have you, right? Don't waste time trying to hit him in center mass. This is just more assurance for him against spears. And we'll be kind of talking more about that in the rules. But this is what I expect a lot of people to be doing, just kind of layering up with pieces like this. Just remember what pieces do what. They are not cumulative. It is merely an individual case by case. So, as representative of that, we have Joseph here who is wearing purely historical gear with the exception of his converse. So, the idea here is this is also to represent um, some things you're going to need to consider if you are coming from a more historical kit. So, for example, maybe you're in the SCA or maybe you have only ever done armor. Right now, Joseph, his brigandine, his gorget, everything like that, that's fine. But he's going to need to have some hard plates to make himself tourney legal. You're still welcome to wear the hosen if you want to wear the hosen. Just bear in mind that you need shin guards, etc., um, and a proper fencing mask. But really, what Jake was wearing, with the exception of the padding, this is what that represents if we were talking pure historical. Not necessarily all that armored, but it's better than nothing. Okay, so now we're moving up to the first kind of series of armor that we've got. And here is Steven. Now, he is wearing an earlier period kit. The official rules for this will be we're accepting armor from 1350 to 1500, um, with some also little outliers. So if you have a good cut and thrust burgonet, we'll get more of that in um, regards to helmets. But that's what we're looking for. It's unfortunate if you have a really, really nice, like, you know, 1600s kit, but this is what we're expecting most people to have. So we've got an earlier period kit to just kind of show how it's all sitting. So the idea here is all the rules we already went over are the same, right? Steven's got his mail, so that means he's needing a structured thrust to get through here, his plate. He also has his helmet, which he doesn't have on right now. Um, we're not going to worry about sabatons. No one will be cutting at the feet, and you should not be cutting at the feet, etc. But as a note, on Steven right now, the palms of his hands, that's just cloth. That's the same as base level. So if you get a thrust into there, that's him done. Uh, same thing is also true on the back of his legs, since he is wearing riding harness. If you can get a point into there, etc., that's good. Though it should be noted that Steven has some padding there because he's rather cheeky. So, go ahead and turn back around. So for this, this is kind of what we're working with. We expect to see this kit a decent amount. Um, we'll go into more detail in regards to requirements for it. But what you mostly want to be seeing is good quality armor, not a lot of rust. Everything is secure. It's not falling off. Everything fits decently well, and that he is covered. So for example, what I don't really want to see it'll still happen maybe, is like we don't want there to be a huge gap between the male and the cuisses, etc. We'd want these to all be fitting well and functioning well and things along those lines. Basically, if it doesn't pass my muster, it's more because I'm worried about keeping you safe than I am critiquing your armor. Okay, so now we're going to go for a slightly later period kit, um, as well as some other little specific rules that will go into here. So this is Nye. Nye is wearing later stuff. Really not much changes. Again, we're looking for good quality things. So this has been, you know, fits him pretty well. Nothing really too much to write home about. Tastics, etc. Um, in regards to the gauntlets, we're totally okay with gauntlets that have the thumb on the outside, just as long as the gauntlets themselves are safe. We know these are safe, though same rules apply. Nye's got van brace under this part of the gloves, but not under this part. Part. You may also notice that Nye is wearing voiders, which means if a point lands here, it's okay. Point lands there, it's not okay anymore. Um, things along those lines. Now, in Nye's case, uh, wearing protective gear in place of greaves. We expect this for everyone in armor. If you don't own a piece of armor that keeps you safe and passes muster, that has to be covered with protective gear. And if a piece doesn't pass, you need to replace it with protective gear. This is going to be somewhat on a case-by-case -case basis, but I hope people will send, if you're curious about anything, send in a picture of your kit so I can get a close-up look and say yay or nay, and you can modify it accordingly. The rules are all exactly the same. Um, all steel armor, 
armor, etc. You know, thrust to here, strikes to here. Now, in regards to Nye, especially when they have their helmet on, a little bit more robust. So if an axe blow lands there, that still could take them out. It's not just the head. This sort of target is what we expect the axes to be going at a lot more since thrusting is frankly not as viable of an option because they're well covered. But we'll be talking more about that when we get to the rules and how to do section. Okay, so let's get into the nitty gritty of some of the armor requirements. Now the main things I'm gonna be focused on are going to be arms uh, and helmets because most press plates, et cetera, as long as they're well made like some of the ones I'll recommend, shouldn't be that much of a problem. But in regards to floating arm pieces like this, so this is of course, you know, later period stuff, this by itself will not be sufficient. So if I were to just slap this over a jacket, the main issues we have is one, this hand won't work with any sort of heavy protection and two, these elbows are just covering the outside. They don't wrap around and actually give protective enough like we would have in tournaments. So this would need to be put over things to make it safe, which this will be kind of on a case by case basis, but I wanted to bring this up now. We will see uh, what people have, you know, but if you take just a pair of jack chains, throw them over the arm guards you already have, that will protect you if a cut lands on it. And we are erring on the side, like I said, self-judging. So if something hits plate but also touches flesh, the plate probably took a decent amount out of it. So even small arm uh, bits of armor like this do make a difference. So next on the list is helmets. Now in regards to helmets that have an aventail, aventail is required for such things because otherwise there'll be a big gap. We're gonna do the pencil test, which is where I will take a number two pencil and I'm going to poke at you. If I find too many gaps that the pencil can fit through, the helmet is not allowed. Um, so in regards to aventail specifically, I require there to be padding behind it. So if you look in here, you'll notice that there's sufficient padding all the way around. Um, this can be a separate piece or it can be in, uh, integral, but the important thing is I do not want there to be any gaps. When the visor closes, that should be all overlapped. There should not be anything serious there, so that way you're nice and safe. And in most cases, this is the only thing to worry about on these, as long as, of course, there is perf plate in the visors. We'll talk about that again in just a moment. So in regards to other kind of later period helmets, we have this as an example. Perf plate is going to be required in visors, like I said, and we're gonna be testing the pencil test. This is a bellows face salette. In regards to the protection that this needs to have, when it's all closed up, there can be no gaps. This is also true for uh, earlier period salettes, which usually have a separate bever. It needs to be all locked up tight. So a single piece is preferred. If you have a two piece, it needs to be protected or connected or locked in some way, because especially with those, there's a huge probability of things getting up in there, and we really do not want to take that risk. Um, padding inside must be sufficient, so you need to make sure you have plenty of protective gear in there. Um, if the padding in here is not good, I will not pass it, even if it's an otherwise good helmet. Okay, now this is gonna be the most case-by-case -case basis, but there is a way of using open face helms. So here we have an a kettle helm, which of course has an open face. We are requiring perf plate face shields. Now these we wear with a bever to close off the gap. It will be a case-by-case -case basis. We don't expect a whole lot of people to have these, so we will have to see what happens. But in regards to them, the mesh must be secured safely, either welded or riveted in or whatever you need. And also, especially if you're dealing with munitions grade helmets, this will not be sufficient. This lining is not safe enough because you will probably get hit with an ax since you're wearing a helmet. You'll need to have some sufficient padding with it to keep you safe. Okay, so in regards to pole arms, we are allowing quite a few different styles of heads, as you can see. Uh, Volges, bill hooks, pole axes, halberds, all on the table. Um, they need to be of either Arkham or Helgi or the Purple Heart variation. We don't have every possible one pictured here. We are cautious about the purple heart mallet heads on the far right. It will be depending upon how people are playing with them, but they tend to hit rather hard. So if you are going to use that, make sure to ex um, have extreme caution as they can be quite dangerous. In regards to the halves that they are mounted on, we're accepting rattan, hickory, etc. whatever will keep it safe. Um, I would be very surprised if we don't have at least one half break. That'll be very unfortunate, but you do not need to go for anything too crazy light. Um, in regards to spearheads, that's kind of the other next bit. We have a long spearhead from Black Fencer 
Razor, as well as the standard Cold Steel and Purple Heart um, spearheads. I will say we don't have the lighter one pictured here, but I find it to be somewhat floppy and not necessarily sufficient. I will post a link to that. In regards to the end caps we have there, the former, the one on the right closest to the long spearhead, I will accept as its own spear point. The latter is only going to be considered a buttstock. This is to ensure that we've got something a little bit nicer possibly hitting people in the face. If you have it on the butt end, you can still attack with it, just it'll be on the butt end rather than the main thrusting zone. In regards to swords and daggers, we are only going synthetic. There will be no steel on the field. The reason for this is protecting of not only just the armor, but also the weapons. If a sword gets caught in wrong and receives enough torque, it can get us hard set or it can break. So we're just sticking to synthetic. Uh, Purple Heart synthetics, Rawling synthetics, all of these and Black Fencer synthetics will all be okay. We are not accepting anything that you would not bout with normally. So no cold steel um, black synthetics as you guys all know them. In regards to daggers, uh, we are okay with wood in this instance as we don't expect the daggers to get pulled all that much unless armor is involved. Um, cold steel, the, uh, the Purple Heart synthetics and wood is okay in this regard. Just bear in mind if you're stabbing people without armor to be nice. In regards to shields and weapon types in general, so shields you are allowed to go steel or synthetic. We are accepting rotellas and other strap style shields. We are accepting bucklers of different types just as long as they don't have spikes on them. In regards to time period though, we are decidedly limiting this. I don't want to have any dark age large center grip shields. I want to stick mostly to the period of which we are using the armor, so rotellas, heater shields, uh, bucklers, those are all fine, uh, it crunches, etc. The same applies to the weapons. I'm looking for more long swords, arming swords. Some sabers are okay, such as the one pictured, but we're and the, and the occasional side sword, but we're not looking for anything too crazy beyond that. Bear in mind that you're going to need to wear tournament long sword tournament level gear. So if you can't fit your heavy into it, you're really not gonna be doing yourself many favors. Okay, so now we come to the what to do and what not to do section. So for this, knives put on all of their armor to make sure they're nice and safe. I'm using a polex for this, though I will mention other weapons as we go. So firstly, before anyone fights, we will be doing a calibration class to make sure that everyone knows exactly how hard to hit, as well as for the armor people, since we are all self-judging, how what you should accept, what you should not accept. Now. I obviously can't show you all exactly what force via visual medium, so I'll be showing some general rules. When it comes to striking with any pole arm, one hand must be in the middle. That can be this way, or that can be this way. But we are not going to be choking up and swinging them like this. That puts way too much danger. In regards to what end to strike with, you can strike with the ax blade or with the mallet. Either way is fine. If it's glancing like that, it won't feel like a hit, so that's not really a big deal. In regards to thrusting, to get through the mail, we need a stout two-handed thrust, so this can be this way or this way, it doesn't necessarily matter. What we're looking for isn't just that sort of poke. Sure, he felt that, but that's not really gonna stop anything. This also applies to flung thrusts. When it comes to flung thrusts, people in armor and mail, I don't want you going out on that. If I flung thrust to something weak, sure, that's flesh. But for this sort of thing, no. I am looking for not just a point on, but a little bit of movement happening to really make sure that the male is doing its job. In regards to striking to other parts, any sort of this strike is okay. If his elbow is forward and I see it vulnerable, you can accept that if you see it. I don't expect to see many strikes to legs. Grappling and hooking is something that will be in the write-up, so bear in mind on that and just kind of stay tuned for it. But besides that, that's kind of what we're looking for. If you do not have a butt end, but you are using a pole axe, this is okay to still count as a point. You can decidedly feel that. We all know exactly what just happened. In regards to like going into bare palm though, all I need to do is just touch it, that's it. So that's mostly what we're looking for. I'm gonna grab a long sword and do a couple more rules. Okay, so in regards to longsword, what I mean by stout thrust, obviously I'm not going to be cutting at him. There will be no Mordschlags. I don't want to see pommels being thrown pretty much at all, right? If you're super up close, someone's probably killing you in the back anyway. So for the most part, we're focusing on fighting at distance, but again, this will be covered in the grappling write-up. 
So, no more slugs. No hooking either, unless you are in armor fighting against someone else. Again, we'll get to that. But what I mean by a stout two-handed thrust, if I have both hands on the grip, enough that it pushes, right? Sure, these will bend and wobble. So if you see something, we have marshals there to call it out if someone's not feeling it. That was clearly a thrust that would go through. But you should also pick your targets, right? If his arm is really thick there, that's two layers of mail, he may not be feeling it very easily. So I'll thrust somewhere that he'll feel it a little bit more immediately. Half sorting thrusts also, that'll give you a much more immediate result, but you're not restricted to them. Um, palm, same sort of idea, everything as was before. Now, in regards to things like daggers, for this, we are still using the exact same rules. I don't expect people to really be cutting with daggers, um, but in theory, a cut really isn't as bad as a thrust, so we're expecting thrust. So for cuts for daggers, just don't worry about them. Unless they're to the face, that maybe you could step out on. That's a self-judge call. So if I get up against nine, and I just poke in the palm, done. If I have to go through mail, we are looking for something stout. So not just in, but in and driving. That's going to clearly stop them. You could also go ahead and put two hands on that if you really need to stop them. Now one thing I want to talk about in regards to uh, fighting against armor, go ahead and about face for me now. If you find yourself in this situation, no matter what weapon you've got in your hand, though I do not want to see people braining each other in the back of the head, right? Neither, however, do I want people to just go, ha ha, I got you, right? I want you to still get a legitimate hit, so here is my advice. Number one, look at where they're weak. Most people do not have armor on the back of their legs. So if I come up, I just gotta poke him. He knows, right? So when it comes to the situation wherein you have a weapon, you are behind someone, if you're gonna plant it, I recommend aiming for kind of the general butt area or the legs or things along those lines because I guarantee a little poke and everyone's going to feel it. This is just a safety thing. Okay, so now in regards to striking our less armored people. We're looking for just good quality cuts. So for example, we're not just like any standard tournament. If it's that, don't worry about it. Keep fighting. We don't want people who are in nothing to feel like they can't play all that much. You are in nothing, but you still have a chance, right? Still has to be a good quality cut, all the regular alignment, etc. You know, draw cuts, all that normal stuff, thrusts, what have you. All this is still on the table. Nothing should really change beyond what you are already used to. Now, in the event, about face, you find yourself in this situation. This you can be a little bit more loose, but again, no striking to the back of the head. Don't make it complicated, right? Just like a standard rule. Instead, you could just poke them. You can very clearly feel that, right? You should not be cutting people when they're not looking at you. It's not hard to thrust. Just take that half second. And if they're not feeling it, do the same thing we did to the armor people. He'll feel that one. Okay, now in regards to spear thrusts, again, axes, etc., are not striking people like this, so everything kind of falls under this gap. We're not looking for you to bury it into somebody. You don't need to do that. That's a plenty sufficient thrust. You can feel that. You know that your time is done. In regards to unarmored, like we talked about, flung thrusts are okay. What I do not want to see, though, is people flung thrusting at the face. If you're going to flung thrust, do it somewhere smart, somewhere lower, right? This is just going to cause injury. Most times, you really shouldn't be aiming for the face anyway in these group fights. If it happens, it happens. But I want people to focus more on center mass for sake of safety, and in general, especially if you're fighting with a spear, you probably have some good range on the guy, or if you're in armor, you don't have a whole lot to fear from the guy. So things along those lines. So that's kind of a visual representation of the rules. I am going to do a much more detailed write-up that will cover other things I could not cover here, but I find that having a visual does help significantly in everyone understanding. We will also be going over these again in the calibration class, the first thing that we're doing day of event. I hope that this will allow people to start training with this mindset, this armor as worn game, because even if you don't have armor, you can still very easily do this within your groups. I want people to come prepared ready to play the game, if at all possible. Um, there are going to be other little details I'll go over, but beyond that, that should mostly cover everything we're looking for. I'm very much looking forward to having you all, and I hope you enjoy this game as much as I do.